see everyone popping in and joining in. Hello, hello, welcome. Today we are talking about unorthodox remedies and I cannot wait to really dive into that with all of you. Um, I know some of you have read it already on your Kindle. Some are waiting patiently for those um, paperbacks. COVID-19 is such an interesting situation just because we typically would do like author meet and greets in like a Barnes and Noble or at places like Writers Atelier, who I'm very thankful and blessed to have, have hosted this for me. Um, Writers Atelier is a great writing spot in Central Florida that provides great resources for writers in the area. They actually did my first book signing and first book release party. So I just want to thank Raquel and everyone at Writers Atelier um, for hosting this today. And also congratulations on your new space because I cannot wait to see this new space that you guys have. With that being said, Unorthodox Remedies um, is my second baby. It's my second book. I am super excited to have been able to um, put a second book out into the universe. I thought that I would have the sophomore slump, which typically happens with a lot of creatives in their projects. You know, you get through that big project, whether it's a music album or your book, or, you know, you came out with a great fashion shoot, but then you kind of get stuck in that sophomore slump where you don't know what your next creative project is and what you want to do next. Um, and so that's where I kind of was with this new book. So my first book, The Secrets of Eden, um, came out in 2017. If you haven't gotten it yet, you're late and you need to order it today. Um, the Secrets of Eden is a young adult fantasy novel, um, magic and castles and murder and scandal. It's as if you took like Harry Potter mixed with like Cinderella and like the TV show Scandal and like mixed it all up. That's my first book. So if you haven't purchased it yet, it is available still via Amazon and a couple other places. Um, but writing fantasy was very different from writing a poetry book. Writing fantasy, you can write anything that you want. You create the world, you create the characters. You know, you have a lot of comfort with writing fantasy, I feel, because you come up with, every, what, with whatever you want to put out in that book. Um, but with the second book, Unorthodox Remedies, I was heavily writing my second manuscript um, for a completely different young adult fantasy novel. And I was super excited super passionate about the project, which I still am. Um, but one day I had like really bad writer's block. Like I could not get past writer's block no matter what I tried. I tried listening to my favorite podcast. I tried listening to my favorite music that, you know, motivates me. But for some reason I could not finish or get through the second manuscript. Um, a couple months ago, I was hanging out with one of my good friends before COVID happened. Um, and he's also creative. His name is Tyler Jacob. And we were just having a hangout day and we were just shooting ideas back and forth. And I told him that I was stuck on this manuscript. And he told me to take a moment, to take a break, breathe and come back to it. So I stopped focusing on the one manuscript, took a break. Um, and it wasn't until I was scrolling through my iPhone. I typically write in my iPhone whenever I have an idea or anything. I was jotting down um, some poetry. Well, the poet, the poem that I wrote, some of the sim the symbolism and the imagery reminded me of other poetry that I had written years prior. So this gave me the idea for Unorthodox Remedies. So I had gone through my poetry collection, and I'm talking about almost 10 years ago, and I was picking out every single poem that had a similar story because I felt with poetry, you have people who are out there that get poetry like that. But then you have people where poetry may not be, you know, the best reading material for them, but they want to read it. So I figured, why not have a poetry book that told a story? And so once I kind of picked out all the poems, there's about 50 total, including the back cover copy and the dedication page. An Orthodox Remedies is a collection of 50 poems, and it focuses on love, destruction, and the healing after it. Um, I found that writing about something that I knew would really resonate and people would be able to relate to it. You know, we've all gone through that first breakup and heartbreak. We've all, you know, thought we found the one and then something happens and then it just goes left. So an Orthodox Remedies kind of really dives into that and it really focuses on, you know, wanting that love and then finding love. But is it the right love? And then if it's not the right love, how do you recover from that? And I know that everyone out there has dealt with a situation like that or even knows someone who's dealt with a situation like that. So I felt Unorthodox Remedies was the perfect book. So I kind of let my gut do the talking for me and I finished putting all the poetry together. And then that's how Unorthodox Remedies was born. Um, and so with this book, um, I know some people are patiently waiting on their copies in the mail, but um, I have my 
author copy here. It says not for resale because it was like the official proof version. Um, but basically, this book won't take you long. It's a light summer read. Um, so take it to the beach with you. Take it, you know, as you go on a trip somewhere post COVID or during COVID, you know, wherever it's safe. Um, but this book is a great book to take with you on a flight, on a car drive while someone else is driving. Um, but I wanted to make sure that the poems in here, they weren't too long, but they were long enough to tell the story that I wanted to tell. And so with that being said, I'll read one of the first poems um, from the first section. So Unorthodox Remedies is told in three different sections. Um, it's told in, from the perspective that finding love is a drug. So the first section is titled The Addiction. And so I'm going to pick my favorite poem from The Addiction. So the first poem that I would want to read to you all today, it's called Moonlight Stranger. Blinding love of a moonlight stranger, seductive smile, uncertain danger. Show me your world of endless desire. Provide satisfaction of curiosity's burning fire. Throw away the key to all of my fears, but never leave my side in a million years. Moonlight stranger, touch my soul. Create a bond of love worth more than gold. So this poem is kind of like when you're after, you're like, dating and like you're in it, you know, you're falling in love, but you may have a little doubt in the back of your head and you're wanting to convince that person like, we belong together. This is what that poem means to me. Um, you know, you're reminding that lover, you know, that moonlight stranger that you met that one date night, you know, like that was us, you know, remember those times, you know, and like create our bond worth more than gold, you know, make it strong, make it pretty, make it everlasting. Um, the first section of unorthodox remedies you will find that the poems are very love heavy um and then they start to tip into the dark side of love um and so speaking of the dark side i will transition now into our middle section the middle section of unorthodox remedies is titled the overdose so in love when you have found that wrong love it's like you're overdosing on a drug because you know it's not good for you but for some reason you keep going back again and again and again. And you find that your loved ones are like, what are you doing? And you find that you're seeing all the signs, but for some reason, this thing just has you hooked. And for some reason you can't break that. So from the overdose, I want to read one of my favorite poems. So I will read Letter to Mars. Now you'll notice in this book that I didn't title the poems. I know the titles, but I wanted the reader to kind of have this um, complete read without breaking up by title poem, title poem. I wanted you to have a journey through each section. So I know the titles of the poems, but you all can make your own title to the poem because I think that's more fun. Um, and so I'll read you all letters to Mars. Writing a letter to reach you in Mars, since it's the place I saw you last, so far away from me. Why? Why Mars? Is it better than our home that we shared? Our quaint little cottage at the end of the road? Our talks and our walks seemed to last forever there. Hand in hand, we laughed. We shared memories and dreams, swapping ideas for our perfect ending. But then you took me on a trip to Mars, not Jupiter or Saturn, but Mars of all places. We walked side by side, but not hand in hand. You let me walk a little bit further than you. And when I reached back for your hand, you were gone. So far gone that I couldn't find you. I left Mars without you, and I wish you took me to Saturn instead. And so um, this poem is about the breakup and what happens after that breakup. You know, you are trying to find all these reasons as to why it was supposed to work out. You're trying to find all these reasons as to why, you know, this, this person was the one for you. But for some reason, like, they're not answering your questions. You didn't have any type of closure. You're just kind of left stuck in limbo trying to figure out where did your relationship go left and why did it go left? And, you know, recalling all those good times is that fight of like, don't you remember the good times that we had? Don't you remember those memories? And it's you begging and pleading that person because at that time, you know, in your journey, you think that person is still the one, you know? So don't, uh, when you're reading this, like you all will kind of feel the different emotions and things as well. Um, but just understand that like these poems are based off of actual things. Now, 
Um, a lot of these poems were inspired by like my past relationships and also some friendships um, where you learn a lot. And I wanted to pour my heart and soul into each poem because I wanted my readers to be able to relate to them. I felt if I was kind of fake with these poems just to tell a story that it wouldn't resonate with anyone. But I found that being honest and being very truthful in these poems will help you really uh, connect with them. I just see that we have some new people joining in. Welcome. Um, I'm just reading a couple poems here. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the comment section. I will be answering some uh, questions uh, towards the end. So we're going to go now to another poem in our middle section of The Overdose. And it is called My Name. I found you before I even knew my name. You're light. Your warmth etched into my memory forever. The way you carried yourself inspired me. I wish I could be more like you. That thing you do where everyone listens to you. I wish I could have your power. You have a way with things. They bend at your touch and fall at your feet. How? How do you do what you do? I tried to be like you once, but I failed. I found myself falling into you and never touching the ground again. Can you let me go? I don't want to be like you anymore. I want to be me. If only I could remember my name. Um, that poem is about losing yourself completely in the relationship and not remembering who you are after. Um, in relationships, you know, sometimes people, they are so invested and you are so much in love that you forget a relationship is about two individuals together, not one individual and someone dependent on them. And this poem kind of recalls that emotion of, I know I need to get out of this funk, but I don't even remember who I am. I don't even remember who I was before this relationship. And that's very important because you find a lot of people go through that where they think to be a part of a relationship, you have to fully lose yourself, but you don't. You should still be yourself at the end of the day. And so with this poem, I wanted to call out that emotion of remember who you are when you are going through those rough times, because at the end of the day, your health and your you know, self-worth is also it's just as important as that other person. So, you know, this is just that reminder of, you know, when you're going through it, remember who you are. Kind of like Lion King, remember who you are. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but, you know, you just have to um, stay true to who you are at the end of the day and remember that you are also important in a relationship. Um, for those asking, I see a question on where can we buy the book? It is live on Amazon right now. It is available via paperback as well as Kindle. If you have a Kindle, you'll get it quicker um, than those waiting for the paperback. Here. So feel free to continue submitting questions. I'm going to read another poem and then we can jump into some back and forth questions and answers. So don't hesitate. I don't bite, I promise. So um, one of my favorite poems out of this whole book is in our final section of the book. So, you know, when someone is on, um, you know, if someone is addicted to something or dealing with substance abuse, you know, after they're coming out of it, they typically go to rehab, you know, to kind of help them um, have the resources and the things that set them up for success to live a life without that substance. So the last section of poetry in our lovely book here is called Rehabilitation, because this focuses on that self-healing and self-love focus after a relationship. So I will be reading to you um, one that's called Circles. This one I like, um, once you all get it, you will see um, the way that it's formatted is very interesting. It kind of goes down the middle of the page and I did that on purpose um, because I think it kind of draws you into the poem. So this is called Circles. Going in circles, falling in line, cursing the shadows, pulling back time. Going in circles, kissing the light, forcing perfection, is everything all right? Going in circles, trusting a lie, swimming in denial, sleeping all night. Going in circles, finding the truth, evaporating sadness, molding a new you. And so um, with circles, I wanted to call out that emotion of you're in that hamster wheel of you're trying to get better, but then something might pull you back, but then you're trying to go forward again. It's kind of like that two steps forward, one step back mentality of you know you're on that right path, but like when you're breaking away from something that you've been stuck to this whole 
time, it may feel foreign to you to do the right thing, to go against the grain. So that's that circle mentality of I'm going in a circle, I'm doing the right things, but is it right? I'm going in a circle, I think I'm doing the right thing, but still it doesn't feel right. So that's what this poem calls out to is that emotion of you're on that path of self-healing, but you know, for some reason there's something in the back of your mind, you know, that is calling you back. And so that's one of my favorites from our final section. I'm going to read a couple more, actually, because these are fun. And I see that people are commenting and are loving me. So might as well read some more. Um, so another one from the rehabilitation that I enjoy is called Yours and Mine. So I was in a place writing this next poem um, after a breakup. I was going through a really rough time um, where I was going through all the emotions that you'll find in this book. And it was kind of that epiphany moment. I actually just got off the phone with one of my best friends. And I remember her asking me kind of like, you know, how much longer are you going to deal with this? Like, how, you, how much longer are you going to put up with this? And I was like, you know what, you're right. And um, this poem kind of talk, calls out like that moment where you realize like, that person was not good for me. And that person left me with so much more baggage and vice versa. So that's what um, this next poem kind of was born out of. My endless cries no longer live here. You took them with you when you left me. Packing up my belongings instead of yours, flaws and insecurities filled your suitcases. You left me with nothing to wear but your confident smile. A few items of class and sophistication lay scattered on my floor. I'm tickled at your mistake because now I'm free and you're stuck with everything you gave me. Um, this poem also is dealing with you realizing karma and understanding that what you put out is what you get back. And when you are in those relationships, those friendships, those hardships of life, understand that at the end of the day, the only thing that you can control is yourself. And that's what this poem is talking about is, you know, that person, although they may not be the one for you, and although they may hurt you, there is still a growth and lesson to be learned out of that situation to where the person who was wrong or the person who was hurt that was fully invested in this relationship and didn't really do anything wrong, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to over overcome it. You know, that person who may have cheated on you, lied to you, broke your heart in so many different ways. Yeah, they may go on and live their life and from the outside looking in, it may look perfect. But remember what you put out into the universe is what you get back. And that's, that calls out in the line, I'm tickled at your mistake because now I'm free and you're left with everything that you And in that moment, you know, in a relationship coming out of it and realizing and remembering who you are, you're now able to say, you know what? I'm better off without you. And those nights of me crying, no more. Those nights of me worrying about it, no more. I'm moving on to other things, but guess what? Now you're stuck with that because you know what you put out is what you get back. And so although they've moved on, those problems will still arise somewhere else. So coming out of a relationship, you know, always focus on yourself and always focus on bettering yourself. Don't worry about that other person. Don't worry about what they're doing. Don't worry about, you know, who they're marrying or who they're with, because remember they were your person at a certain time and you know who that person is. And that's why when they leave, they take that same baggage with them, but, and they took a little bit more because now you're free. You're free of them. You're free of them and their, their baggage and their damage. And now you're able to breathe a little bit more. Um, I see we have some more people joining in. Hi, welcome. Feel free to submit some questions. I'm actually going to dive into some of those right now um, because I feel like you all have great questions. Um, so let's see. Um, this question is from Writers Atelier. We met when you wrote your first young adult novel. Will you write another young adult? And do you think you'll write any other poetry collections? So to answer that question, yes. I actually, um, as a writer, one thing that's very important is to always write. You should always be writing constantly. Whether you have a composition book, you jot notes in your iPhone, you should always be writing daily to kind of keep your craft going. You know, just like singers have to always sing, as a writer, you should always be working that muscle. So with that being said, um, I have a couple more young adult novels that are developed. I just haven't taken the time to um, write them yet. Um, so for example, I have a young adult horror novel. I have a young adult fantasy novel. I have a young adult mystery thriller um, that are all in the works. So stay tuned for those. Um, those will be coming out um, in due time. As far as any other poetry collections, you know, actually, yes. Um, after I kind of put together Unorthodox Remedies, I figured why not do more poetry? 
I don't know how soon I would come out with another poetry collection because I don't want to rush that process. For me, poetry kind of comes natural. I'll be sitting in the parking lot at a Publix being like, oh my God, that's a great poem. And I will sit and jot it all the way down. Um, so I definitely want to do another poetry collection at a certain point. Um, I just don't know when, but stay tuned as well. Another question that I have is, so why is my name different on the book than in real life? So it's kind of like being a performer. So um, I try to keep my personal life and my um, work life kind of separate um, to where I can still kind of have a little privacy um, just because in this day and age of social media and technology, everyone knows everything about you. And so um, that's why I've always had a different type of stage name. I actually came up with my stage name back in high school. It was a project that we did. I used to be an actor, Whoop. Troop 4056, if anyone is asking. And um, one of our projects was to come up with a stage name. So my original stage name, this is actually pretty funny. My original stage name was a lot longer. I had incorporated one of my middle names and it was Cecil B for Brandon and Good. I don't know where I got that from. I thought it was flashy. I thought I would belong on Broadway. So I was like, if I'm gonna be in Broadway and if I'm gonna be in someone's playbill, I need a big flashy name. So that's where that came from. But then um, Brandon Good just kind of had a better sound to it and it rolls off the tongue easier. And so that's how Brandon Good was born. So let's see here. What other questions do I have? How do you balance with your full-time job with writing life? Whew. <laughs> I don't. I'm just kidding. Um, balancing a full-time job and a writing lifestyle is very, very difficult. I remember writing my first book, Secrets of Eden, and I literally would have a day that went like this. I set an alarm for 6 a.m. I would be up writing by 6.30 a.m. till about 8.30 a.m. At the time, I didn't have to go into work till about 10. So I would then you know, shower, get ready for work, go to work, go to my car on my lunch break, do some writing there, um, go home after work, run around the lake for exercise, order and cook dinner, take a shower, and then spend the night writing from like nine till midnight or 9 a.m., uh, excuse me, 9 p.m. to like 1 a.m. Um, trying to find time to write has been one of the biggest challenges working full time. Um, it is my dream one day to be able to write a lot more um, and not work full time. I want writing to kind of be my full time gig. So um, balancing it is a challenge, but it is doable for those asking, and I can elaborate more on that if anyone is asking about that as well. You ran a big fan. Oh, thank you so much, Javi. Do you believe we each have a soulmate? This is a great question. Um, I'm gonna take a quote from um, Sex in the City and say I think that we have multiple soulmates. I think that when it comes to love, you're always, because you as a person are growing, your preferences change. And I think from your first relationship to that relationship that is happily ever after or your forever, your preferences of things have changed with you growing. So therefore you would have a different soulmate at different periods of time because you were supposed to meet them. You were supposed to learn something, whether it was good or bad, but there was something that drew you into them. In a sense of other relationships like family and friendships, um, definitely I think you have you know soulmates in them as well, because sometimes our friends know us better than our spouse. And sometimes our brothers and sisters or moms know us better than our friends and vice versa. So I definitely think that we have multiple soulmates and not just one. That is a great question. Um, I have another question that says, what did you enjoy writing more, poetry or fantasy? Um, and plays in the future. So I, um, I like writing fantasy a lot. Um, I grew up reading the Harry Potter books, a series of unfortunate events, um, Artemis Fowl. Um, I did not read Lord of the Rings because although I like to read, that would have taken up my whole childhood. So um, I love writing fantasy because I like creating stories that I wish that I had growing up. So my first book was a black gay fairy tale. Our, our, our main character is a black gay teenager coming into power. So, you know, I wanted to read stories like that growing up. So I have a lot of fun writing those stories. And sometimes it sucks because you already know the outcome of the story and you feel bad for your characters because you know what you're about to put them through. Um, but when it comes to poetry, I love it in a different way because it's more real and it's more raw. Um, with poetry, I find that you have to really be able to tap into that. And I found that you really have to be able to um, 
paint a story in so many words or less. So it can be challenging because with a novel, you have all this grand space, all these thousands of words to be able to paint your picture. But with poems, yeah, you can make a poem as long as they're short you want it to be, but you still wanna make sure that that story is told at the end of the day. That's why I'm a big fan, for example, of TV show adaptations of books versus movies. Because with a TV show, you can have eight weeks of an hour episode, therefore eight hours in total to really tell a story, whereas a movie is only two hours and some things are on the cutting room floor. So um, I love writing both. Um, they both have a special place in my heart. Let's see. Um, what are some of your uh, young adult or poetry influences or favorite authors. So J.K. Rowling was one of my favorite authors growing up. Um, another author that I loved growing up was Perry Moore, um, rest in peace. He wrote the young adult novel Hero. And Hero, for those who don't know, is about this young man coming to terms with his sexuality while living in a world of superheroes and coming to terms that he's a superhero. So all of that may sound okay, but you then get into the plot that his dad used to be a hero sidekick and he no longer likes heroes. But then he also thinks that his dad isn't accepting of gay people. So there's a lot of drama there, but it was a really great book and it really motivated me to become a writer. I actually had the um, chance to interview Perry when I was in high school. Um, I actually would email him and he would email me back and then his assistant set up some time for us to talk on the phone. And I remember him pouring out his heart about how he loved writing and telling the stories that he wanted to read growing up and he loved reading comics. And so that kind of really related with me. And he's always been a true influence for me to this day. Um, so anytime I write anything, I think about Perry and I pull up our old emails. Um, so he's been a big influence to me as well as um, Patricia Engel. She was my college at FIU. I went to Florida International University. She was my creative writing professor, and she is a two-time New York Times bestseller. Um, one day I will be on that list. Uh, but basically, um, my first novel was a short story that she inspired me to make into a novel. She read the short story because it was our semester project, and she told me that I should elaborate on it more, and I finally did it. And so um, and to this day, I try to keep in contact with her as well. So those are some of my favorite influences or favorite authors. Um, but I'll even say one of my favorite books is a separate piece by John Knowles. Um, it was on my AP literature reading list back in high school over 10 years ago. And that book has stuck with me to this day. Um, let's see here. Any favorite writing snacks or favorite drinks, coffee or tea? Yes. So um, when I used to, fun fact, I used to be a teen journalist for a publication known as Florida Today here in Florida. And um, from there, I went down to Florida International University and wrote for their um, staff on the campus newspaper. And anytime I would have a deadline, my go-to writing snack would be a cup of hot tea. Anyone that knows me out there knows I love my tea. And it was a cup of ramen noodles. I don't know what it is about the combination of hot tea and ramen noodles, but your boy can throw down some words if he has a cup of hot tea and ramen noodles. So if you all ever need me to write anything for you, I won't charge you. I just need a cup of hot tea and ramen noodles. Um, let's see here. So uh, was writing this book in a sense of finding your own healing and closure? Um, I would say yes and no. So I feel this kind of allowed me to really pull out my emotions of past situations that I had gone through. I feel like I finally had closure from those situations just because I would talk to my uh, sister. One of my sisters is like my best friend and my mom. Like I talk to them every day. So whenever I'm going through something, if I'm not talking to my best friends or my sisters, um, I'll call up my therapist because I think that in order to get through something, you have to surround yourself with good people to set you up for success. And at this point in my life, I've healed from all the things that I've gone through. So I felt it was more of like a um, walk down memory lane of, remember when you were in that situation and you know you had a feeling it was gonna turn out that way. Um, but I found that it was a great way for me to be able to reach back into those emotions, to know how I felt so that I can share them with you all. Uh, next question is, I know you kind of touched on your different inspirations for writing, but what inspires you the most to write? Is there always one thing you can count on to inspire you to tap into your writing creativity? Um, 
that's such a hard question because I get inspired by so many different things. I can get inspired by a song. I can get inspired by a cloud. I can get inspired by the water on my window uh, when it's raining. Um, it's very hard to pinpoint it. Being a writer, I think the best advice that I learned was to always carry something with me to be able to write whatever I was thinking down. So in my car, excuse me, I literally have two journals in my glove box. Um, I always have my iPhone on me to jot things down because no matter where I am, I can always hear something or just see something. And I'm like, that would be a good idea for a book or that'll be a good, a good idea for a poem. Sometimes I just start writing words in a notepad and sometimes they just make sense. Um, so as far as a specific source of inspiration, that's hard to pinpoint because I'm inspired by many different things. Let's see here. Our next question, are you a plotter or pants? Oh, I'm a plotter. I have to plot it all out. I need to know exactly what's happening in this book, who's doing what, what's happening where. Um, with Unorthodox Remedies, it was very different because this is a collection of poetry. And some poetry collections are not formatted for you to read them as a story. They're formatted because they're just poems, where this, um, because it tells a story, I had to put them specifically and strategically in order. And so that was a bit of a challenge because some of the poems, they're not similar in a way, but they touch on um, similar themes. So that's where I would get stuck sometimes. So plotting it out, I was like stuck in my room for two hours being like, no, that goes there, that goes over there. Um, but I typically plot out everything that I write because I find it keeps me on track and it keeps me accountable of my goals that I need to accomplish. <laughs> what kind of tea? Any. I love any type of tea. Um, any type of tea gets me writing. Let's see. Next question. What was the inspiration behind your debut novel? And maybe you can touch on the importance of own voices. Yes. So for those who don't know, own voices is a big movement in literature where, you know, diversity is a very, very important thing. And you want to make sure that those voices that are unique to those stories are being told. So, for example, being a black gay male, I would only tell typically stories that I can relate to because I know a part of that experience because of what I've been through. Now, I don't know the experience of some of my friends who are of different races and different backgrounds. And so that's why Own Voices is important because it gives people the platform to tell their story and the stories that need to be told. Um, the inspiration behind my debut novel, fun fact, was how I met one of my exes. So <laughs> I think this is like the first time I'm telling this story like in, in a broad audience. My friends know this. So years ago now, over like nine years ago now, 2011, so that's nine years ago. I can do math. Um, I was invited to a party. One of my friends was trying to put me up with someone. And I typically do not like to meet people through like arranged situations because no. And um, it was about basically I went to this party. I met him. We hit it off. Yada, yada, yada. Fast forward when I had to do my semester project at FIU writing a creative short story. I thought about the story of how I met my ex. And then I kind of twisted a little bit as opposed to a party. It was a ball, you know, and it was grand and it was it was a, this whole spectacle. So that was the inspiration behind my first novel because it was a short story first. Um, but beyond that, it took me about four years to fully develop that novel because I did not know what I wanted it to do. I knew I didn't want it to be another Harry Potter. I knew I didn't want it to be another Hunger Games. So it was hard trying to find my way as a new author. But once I kind of figured out where I wanted the story to go, remembering the books that I wanted, where I saw someone like me winning and finding the love and beating the bad guys, um, you know, that's why I wrote The Secrets of Eden. Great question. I know someone um, submitted a question about vulnerability and was it hard for me to be vulnerable with writing this um, book? The answer is yes. Um, being vulnerable, I want people to know, is not a bad thing. Being vulnerable is also a superpower. You know, being able to let your walls down to say, hey, I'm trusting you. I'm letting my walls down. It takes a lot of strength. And so never think that being vulnerable is a bad thing. It's actually a gift. I remember when I used to be a journalist years ago, I always had thought that my emotions would be my weakness because in journalism, you can't show emotion. You got to tell a story. You have to put it out there. But my emotions also became my superpower because I knew how to tap into that emotion to get the article out. I knew how to tap into that emotion to ask the right questions. So never view your vulnerability as like a weakness or anything, but definitely it was vulnerable for me to write this book and put these collections of poems together because 
I'm telling you all about my life in, in some way. I'm telling you all about some of the things that I've been through or some situations that I'm aware of that have happened to other people. So being vulnerable definitely played into me writing this. And, you know, overcoming being vulnerable, I would say is just trust in yourself and trust in the people around you. You know, if you are surrounded by those loving people in your life, there is no reason to not be vulnerable with them and open up and tell your story. I find that we all have different stories that are actually very similar, but because we're afraid or ashamed to share them, we feel very isolated. You know, we all go through different things in life um, right now and, you know, years before as well. But sometimes a lot of those situations are easier if we would have just talked to someone. Um, you know, my mom raised me and my siblings to be very independent. So I kind of get stuck in a way sometimes to where I think I can solve everything. Like put me in their coach and I got it. But sometimes you have to let people know that, hey, I need help or hey, you know, I may need some assistance. So as long as you're surrounding yourself with the right people, being vulnerable is never going to be an issue. I hope that makes sense. What other questions do I have coming in? What advice might you give to a poet to a writer wanting to start writing poetry? Um, I would say read some poetry first. I think that people feel that poetry always has to be rhymy, like the sky was blue and then I tied my shoe and then I went to the zoo, but it does not have to be like that. Um, you know, poetry is what you want it to be. And I think sometimes authors can get stuck or people who want to write get stuck and what they think a good poem is versus a bad poem. But a poem is whatever you want it to say. It could be a sentence, it could be three pages. Whatever you want it to be and whatever you're wanting to write about, write it. Don't be afraid to do it. Write it and take a moment to take a break from it and then go back and read it again because it's gonna hit you a different way every time you come to it. Uh, when I'm reading this book right here, Unorthodox Remedies, anytime I read it, I feel a different emotion and I can pull a specific memory for each poem. And for those who bought the book, I challenge you to do that. When you're reading through this and you're trying to identify what you feel, try to remember those situations that you've been through. With poetry, you'll find that a lot, a lot of poets put their emotions strongly into these words. And so with reading poetry, you're able to connect and say, wow, this poet was able to do this. So I can definitely do that. So when you're reading this, definitely pull those emotions and those memories to the forefront. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable while you're reading this. Um, I, someone left a great review. Becky, let, thank you so much for the review. Um, she said it brought her to tears. You know, those types of things, not someone crying brings me joy, but the fact that someone could relate to the words that I was able to write for you all is what brings me joy because like I said, we've all been through some of these situations before. So um, for anyone wanting to write poetry, just go for it. Like there's no reason that you shouldn't. Uh, let's see, my current work in progress. So um, I have a couple of current works in progress right now um, with some working titles. Um, I mentioned them before. So the young adult thriller mystery is called I Woke Up in Blood. And basically it's about someone waking up in blood. <laughs> um, then I have a young adult horror novel uh, called Red Bud Street. Uh, my relatives and anyone from Melbourne knows what Red Bud Street is or where Red Bud Street is, but they won't know what the story is about. It's actually inspired by a folk tale that my family used to tell, um, scaring us as children growing up. And then I also have a working title called Soul Punch. It's the one that will probably be coming out next. It's about three siblings who get superpowers from their grandmother's soul food dinner. So, you know, who would have thought eating some fried chicken would give you super strength? So um, keep a lookout for those. Um, those are my works in progress right now. And, you know, I can't wait to share those with you all as well. Um, but again, thank you all so much for being here. If you guys, I still have like 18 minutes, so keep pouring the questions in. I'm gonna get back to reading another favorite poem from this lovely book here. So this one is called Devil. I won't tell you what part it's in. I think you guys can kind of figure it out from the three uh, sections that I told you all about. But this one is one of my favorites as well. Here we go. My friends warned me about the devil once charming smile in Tom Ford Cologne. His dance would leave you empty, but your heart would yearn for more of him. Every year he searches for a new Persephone, wanting to brand and mold someone into his own. My friends told me about the devil once, his false promises and shadowed future, fruitless plans while drowning you deeper. His eyes are hypnotic diamonds while his body is chiseled of gold. His blackened heart drains your strength and weakens your defenses. But I didn't tell my friends about the devil and me, who knocked on my door and I, I let him inside. So um, 
this poem is about when you know and come to the re realization that your relationship is, isn't what you thought it was. And you know how we talk to our friends, like my best friends know, shout out to all my best friends out there. Uh, my best friends know, like they hold me accountable and I hold them accountable. And so it kind of touches on my friends warning me about said person. My friends are telling me about this person and I'm kind of like, yeah, you know, okay, that's great. But you know, you should always kind of heed Advice, not all the time, because sometimes you can get it from sources that are not good to you. I only trust people close to me. But if my friends genuinely have concerns about someone and they bring them to me, I take a moment to really listen and digest it. And so what this poem was about was there, this person's friends is telling them like, hey, this guy is not for you. You need to look out. But this person's kind of like, well, I haven't told them that I already let him in and I'm kind of already seeing him and this relationship isn't what it's supposed to be. Because sometimes we get embarrassed to tell those who are close to us, you know, when we're hurting or when we've realized something, but you shouldn't be afraid to do that. So this poem kind of touches on, you know, knowing that this relationship isn't good for you, but not saying anything about it. Because I think sometimes we think if we say it out loud, it makes us look bad, but it doesn't because we've all, I guarantee we've all been in situations that we didn't think would pan out to be that the way that they were. And the more that we incorporate our loved ones to knowing they can sometimes help you get out of it. They can sometimes kind of redirect you or give you the words that you need to pull through. And so that is another one of my favorite poems. Uh, let's see. What do you like to do for fun outside of writing? Okay. So outside of writing, I love to cook. I love eating food. So I'm always cooking something. I love to travel. Um, and so with this whole COVID-19 situation, it kind of slowed down my traveling for the year, but I do love to travel. I love going on random adventures. Like I love just calling up one of my friends being like, hey, do you just wanna go for a drive? And like driving somewhere completely new and discovering something brand new. Um, and so those are things that I like to do outside of writing. Also, I love watching Real Housewives, um, specifically Atlanta and Beverly Hills and Potomac. Slight Bravo plug, sorry. Um, but those are the things that I do outside of writing to kind of keep my sanity, um, but also to staying active, going for runs and things like that as well. For those who are just joining in, we have about 15 minutes left. Feel free to submit any questions that you may have, whether it's about my writing, about this book, future works, or anything as well. Um, I just got a question that says, if you could be any one of your characters in any one of your books, which one would you be? Mm, okay, so this is a trick question for me. So with this being a poetry book, it's somewhat a part of me. So I won't use that. I'll use my first book. Um, I would pick Eden, hands down, from The Secrets of Eden. For those out there who have read it, put it in the comments because y'all know why. But basically, Eden starts his journey as trying to figure out who he is. But at the end of that book, like, it's just so spectacular. I can't spoil it. But if I could be any character in any one of my books, it definitely would be Eden because I think he has a great character journey. He goes through so much. But at the end of that book, like, homeboy is popping. That's all I'm going to say on that. Um, let's see here. When it comes to poems, do you like to title them or not? Um, I actually just touched on this not too long ago, but I love this one. For this book specifically, I did not title them because I wanted it to be a seamless experience of you going through the emotions and dealing with what this character is dealing with. And I challenge you all to come up with your own titles for them. There are titles of them. And if you all want me to release them, I definitely can release like a concrete list of the title so you kind of know what I call them. But I don't feel that it's necessary to always title a poem. You can honestly just do like poem one, you know, volume one, volume two. It's all about you. Don't think that there are these specific parameters of how to write correctly when there's not. I mean, grammar and things play into it, of course, but when it comes to your creative side and what you're trying to convey, don't feel that there's a specific formula that you need to follow when it comes to publishing. Let's see. Has travel inspired your writing? Yes. Um, for example, I was in Virginia Beach about four years ago visiting one of my good friends, and I was touring his college campus. And out of that kind of gave me the idea of my horror novel, because at night you could hear all the cicadas in the trees, and like the trees would make these noises. And it was very eerie, like very, very eerie. So anytime I'm traveling anywhere and I find something that will inspire me, I jot it down on my iPhone. My iPhone section is filled with 
with novel ideas, book ideas. Sometimes um, I develop, like I try to develop scripts. I actually got to pitch a show idea last year. So I do things like that as well, where if I have an idea for something, I definitely jot it down no matter where I am. So definitely travel does inspire my writing because I think it's a fresh new scene that I'm not used to and it gives me a fresh new idea. Let's see, I have more questions coming in here. Um, will you have a book launch party once COVID is over? Um, hopefully. Um, the original plan was to do a big book signing where I was going to invite a lot of people out. So the first book as well as this book, do some poetry readings, do some signings, and of course, hors d'oeuvres and music and the whole thing. But of course, the lovely COVID-19 happened and um, you know slowed everything down, but I'm being as safe as possible. I hope you all are being safe as possible. And once it's safe enough to have a gathering of that size, I definitely will be doing that. And who knows, at that time, I may have another book out. Let's see here. Do you have a favorite poem out of the whole collection? No, um, I have favorites, but I don't have a specific favorite one because I think they all are very important to the story that I'm telling. And I feel like if I just pick out one specifically, it kind of diminishes the other. Um, so no, not necessarily. Like, I think they're all pretty beautiful. And when you all have a chance to read it, for those who haven't read it, you'll see that. And for those who have read it, definitely, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, feel free to submit a couple more questions. I'm going to read one more poem and then I'll get to those questions and wrap up for today. Again, thank you all so much for being here. So. This next poem, let's see here, is in our final section of the rehabilitation. I feel like I'm at church. Like, open up your Bibles too. <laughs> so this one is called Words. I should have had the words when our worlds collided, shooting stars and swirling cosmos. Searching for those words, my words, I fell into a portal the portal of confusion where I drowned, deeper underneath the words that I needed. You saw me floating beneath the tides of here and there. The space in between our realities faded away as you saved me. Extending your hand and your comforting smile, I found safety in you. But I realized the you I viewed was my own reflection. And I finally found the words, my words that I already knew. Um, this poem, um, touches on when you were finally gotten to the place where you realized that the savior that you needed was yourself. It never was the other person. It never was that, you know, this prince was going to bust in and, and save the day. I sound like the Cheetah Girls. Um, <laughs> to come in and save you. But this is about you realizing that at the end of the day, you only needed yourself in that relationship once it went sour. And yourself is what's going to make sure that you're okay at the end of the day. So always put yourself first. That's the importance of that part. Let's see your question. Oh, hi, Beth. Hi, Andy. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, let's see here. Why did you name the book Unorthodox Remedies? Oh, great question. Here we go. So everyone has been wondering, what does the title mean? So some people are familiar with the term Unorthodox Remedies, but some aren't. When I thought about this book and when I tied the symbolism to a drug addiction, I found it to be about how we go through different things of life, and there's no cookie cutter way to heal. So, you know, when you go through a breakup, some people, you know, you talk to your friends, some people, they get a therapist, some people, they cry. Whatever we go through and the ways that we cope is kind of what ties into the title, an orthodox remedy. So whatever the remedy is that you find that helps you, that's what that means. So, you know, whatever I go through is gonna be different from whatever you go through and whatever remedy that I try may be different for you. Therefore, it's gonna be unorthodox because way that I got to healing is going to be different from the way that you got to healing. And those two ways are not identical. Therefore, it's an unorthodox remedy. So that's where the title came from. So each poem I consider one of my little remedies because it's pulling forth those emotions to make you think back to when you were in that spot and how you felt and how you grew out of that. So I hope that answers your question. So we have a couple more minutes. Feel free to submit a couple more questions. Um, again, thank you all so much for being here. And thank you all so much for supporting Unorthodox Remedies. As of today, it is still a number one new release um, in the category on Amazon. So thank you all so much for your love and support. Um, I'm technically considered a bestseller. Um, <laughs> Never thought I would see the day. I mean, I made a goals list years ago where I was like, 
I want to be a bestseller by 25. Um, but God was like, no, you're going to be a bestseller by your 28. And so it's just been truly a blessing to be able to share my love and my craft with you all and for it to be received so well and so warmly welcomed. It just makes me so, so happy. Um, so thank you all so much for supporting. Um, I have a couple more minutes again for questions. Feel free to submit a question and I'll make sure to answer it for you. Uh, let's see here. What do you think is the most fun thing about writing? Um, I think it's because I get to express myself. Um, just like a chef gets to express themselves through their food and their cooking, writing brings me so much joy. Um, you guys have no idea. I will sit for hours and write. I remember when I was writing The Secrets of Eden, I woke up at 8 a.m., went to a Starbucks, wrote from like 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., met one of my friends to go see X-Men uh, Apocalypse, which was not a great movie. Um, and then I, once the movie was over by like 3.30, I went right back to that Starbucks and wrote until like nine o'clock at night. Writing just brings me so much joy because I can see the images in my head and writing them out means that you guys can see those too. So that's why I get super excited because you all will get to experience, you know, the stories that I come up in this crazy brain of mine. And trust and believe, I have some fun projects on the way. So please keep supporting. Please keep um, a lookout for Brandon Good. All right, thank you. Thank you all so much. God's timing is always best. Yes, God's timing is the best timing. That is the one timeline that I go by. Congratulations. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope you all order your books. Uh, again, they are available via Kindle on Amazon as well as paperbook on Amazon.com. Um, you know, and the book, it's not too big. Like I said, it is a light summer read, you know, white cover, 50 poems in total, including the back cover copy as well as the dedication page. Um, and you will find that these poems, the formatting is different for some of them on purpose um, for you to really dive into that poem that you are reading. What is your writing vibe? What does your surrounding have to be for you to get into your zone and just write? Um, great question, Nini. I have to have music. I write best with a good playlist, whether it's songs with lyrics or no lyrics. I find that if I create myself a great playlist, depending on the type of book that I'm writing. So for Unorthodox Remedies, I listen to a lot of Janae Aiko. For those who know Janae, I listen to a lot of LMA. I listen to a lot of um, John Legend um, to kind of get me in the zone of how to put these poems together. And also for this book, I wrote a couple more poems to fit the narrative. So whenever I'm writing something, I try to make a playlist of music that's relevant to the piece that I'm writing to give me that good push of inspiration and to really get into the zone. So for my superhero novel, for example, my whole playlist is nothing but Marvel scores. I love the Black Panther score. I love the Avengers scores. So those are in that playlist when I am writing that. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for supporting. Thanks, Raquel, for having me. Everyone, shout out to Raquel at Writers Atelier. Please make sure to check them out. They are doing great things for writers in the Central Florida area. Again, they did my first book release and launch, and they are truly a blessing to writers here. I actually taught a workshop there not too long ago about how to pitch your novel, and someone was able to get a great pitch, and um, her novel was published, and I bought that novel. It's really good. Make sure to check it out by Taylor Simons. So let's see here. Do I have any more questions? Again, guys, y'all have a couple more minutes. Ask anything you want to pertaining to writing, the books, my creative process. Um, I am here to help you all. I have a question that says, you mentioned other creative projects and you mentioned a show idea. Have you ever thought of writing for television? Yes. Um, I am in the process of figuring out how to write a full pilot. Um, because I want to break into television writing. So that is definitely something that I am looking into right now. So um, my writing is basically um, universal. Like I don't try to pinpoint it into one specific thing. If I feel like doing it, I'm gonna do it. Can we get the link one more time? I lost it in the comments. Absolutely. I will make sure to post the link um, in the comments as well. And so let's see here. I'll read you all one more poem um, before I am done. So this poem, let's see, what should I read you all? Oh, I have the perfect one. So I'll take it all the way back to the beginning. The very first poem 
Um, and it kind of introduces you to where our character is, if you want to classify him as a character, him or her, however you knew the person in Orthodox Remedies. Um, but this is a poem called January. January sadness parades again in my dreams, laughing silently through the glass, feeling the delusion of creativity. Hollow gardens smell of sweet potpourri and cinnamon lilies. Trusting the image of my crystal wonderland, I step out, lend you my hand, Welcome to the place known as my own slice of heaven. So this poem kind of focuses on when you are in that space of wanting to date and wanting to put yourself out there. January sadness, I use that um, because it's like January is the start of a new year, but also too, you're kind of mourning that Christmas over. You're kind of mourning that the previous year has ended. Um, and you know, so with that, you know, you're kind of like, oh my God, like, when is it going to happen for me? I am ready. I am ready. So that whole, you know, um, I step out, lend you my hand. That's when that person is ready to start the, and, and continue on that new journey. So thank you all so much. This has definitely been fun. Again, make sure to get your copy of Unorthodox Remedies available on Amazon for both Kindle and paperback. Um, this has been so much fun. A big thank you again to Raquel at Writers Atelier. Please, everyone, show them some love. Like their page. Um, that was what this was hosted through. Um, but I hope you all get your book, and please continue to support Brandon Good. I am on Instagram at b.goode. My writer website will be launching soon, as well as my new Facebook page. It was taken down to revamp it with all the new stuff, and will be up soon so that you all can connect and keep up with me um so thank you all so much again your support is just amazing and i couldn't be able to do it without you all supporting me um and so thank you so much again and make sure you that you do get your copy of this lovely summer read here have a great day thank you for tuning in